Let's uh, go back to what we were doing last time, and it's uh, essentially uh, another view into, into uh, Fourier series by looking at signals as being vectors. So <coughs> let's take a look at uh, this is second look at Fourier series. <coughs> Consider now a set of functions, x n of t, that are given as uh, cosine n uh, omega 0 t and sine n omega 0 t for n equal to 0, 1, 2, and so on. Right? So I have a whole bunch of sines and cosines. They are, they are uh, given in this form. The interval over which I'm going to be looking this set is t0, which is 2 pi over omega 0. Right? That's the interval. Remember, we always define vector space on a given interval. Now, one thing that we demonstrate about this set is that all the elements of the set are mutually autonomous. What does that mean? Let's take a look at it. In, in this case, we have uh, two things. Uh, if I take the dot product of cosine n omega 0 t and cosine uh, m omega 0 t, which is, remember, it's going to be integral over t0, where t0 is defined this way, cosine of n omega 0 t times sine of m, oh, sorry, not sine, cosine again, right? Cosine m omega 0 t dt. Then uh, with some math, you can easily show that this is equal to 0 if n is different than m, right? This, uh, this comes as two cosines, cosine of sum, cosine of the difference. When n is different than m, you end up integrating cosine over integer number of periods, right? So the dc value is equal to 0. So this is 0 when n is different than m. It is t0 when n is equal to m, but different than 0, right? So when n and m are equal, but they're different than 0, and it's equal to, um, sorry, t0 over 2, and it's equal to t0 when n is equal to m is equal to 0. When n is equal to m equal to 0, then this is cosine, this is 1 times 1, which is 1, integral over t0 is t0. So you have this value. So these functions are orthogonal, mutually orthogonal, whenever uh, n is different than m, which, uh, you know, uh, and then when n is equal to m, there is some energy here, right? The second thing that we can easily demonstrate is this. If I take the dot product of cosine of n omega 0 t and sine n omega 0 t, this is always equal to 0 for every n and, and, uh, and for every n and m. So sine is always orthogonal to cosine as long as they're even if they're at the same frequency. So now, let's define the following set of functions. x0 of t is equal to 1. Uh, x1 of t is equal to cosine 2 pi f0 t. x2 of t is sine 2 pi f0 t, x3 of t is cosine of 2 pi 2 f 0 t, x4 of t is uh, sine of 2 pi 2 f 0 t, and so on. You understand what I'm doing? I'm just taking these functions and writing them out here. Uh, the energy of this one, if I take uh, dot product, uh, with itself uh, is kind of given here. n is equal to m, uh, but it's different than 0. If I take the dot product with cosine with itself, 
So, so the energy of this one is equal to T0 over 2. Energy of this one is T0 over 2. Uh, energy of this one is T0 over 2. Energy of this one is T0 over 2. What's the energy of this one? If I take the dot product of itself and integrate over T0, mm -hmm. what is the energy? T0, right? So the energy of the zero one is equal to T0. So that's, a, that's, that's all description of this particular set. The set is orthogonal, and uh, these are the energies of individual components. Last time, we demonstrated this. If I'm to take a function x of t and write this as c0 times x of 0 of t plus c1 x1 of t plus c2 x2 of t and so on, right? This is what am I trying to do? I'm trying to approximate my any arbitrary function x of t on the interval t0 with <coughs> these mutually orthogonal functions. We went through the derivation last time and we showed this, that ci needs to be dot product between x of t and xi of t divided by energy on the i component. This is a general solution, it had nothing to do with this particular Fourier series. If I have a, any set of functions which are mutually orthogonal, these coefficients here are determined by this relationship. So let's apply this to this particular set that I have here. What is C0? It's going to be dot product of x of t with x0 of t divided by the energy of, of 0. <coughs> energy of 0 is t0, so it's 1 over t0 integral over t0 x of t times 1 dt. Right? Our good old friend. We recognize this. This is how you obtain the first coefficient. So this is our a0. Um, the ci, or let's say we have uh, ci can be uh, two things. Let's say, let me just do c1. c1 becomes x of t times x, or the dot product of x1 of t divided by the energy of the first one. The energy of the first one is t0 over 2, so we get 2 of t over t0 integral over t0, x of t times cosine 2 pi f0 t dt, which is our cosine, cosine uh, term, uh, this is our a1, right? And let's take a look at c2, this becomes dot product of x of t times e, e dot product of x2 of t, divided by the energy of t2, which is 2 over t0, integral of t0, x of t times sine 2 pi f0 t dt, and so on. What, is, what are these formulas? These are, these are good old friends. These are the Fourier series expansion formulas. So what is it that I'm doing when I'm, when I'm uh, when I'm finding the Fourier series. I'm imagining uh, an infinite set of mutually orthogonal functions or mutually orthogonal vectors that I cannot really draw on the board, but this is your one. This is cosine 2 pi f 0 t. This one is cosine 2 pi 2 f 0 t. You know, sine of 2 pi f 0 t. And I have infinitely many of them, right, in all possible directions. And then what I have <coughs> to do is I have my function x of t, which is this guy, and I'm decomposing this x of t along all of these individual vectors. And how do I decompose it? I take the dot product and I normalize that with the with the energy of the, of the signal that I'm taking the dot product. Why do you need to decompose that? Uh, well, you need it for all sorts of things. Remember, we did it to do bandwidth, we did it to do 
you know, to see the spectral content of the signal, right? Mm -hmm. So we always decompose it, right? But the, this is just a different way of how you can look at it. Right, go ahead. But if they're orthogonal, you only have so many you can do, then you'd run out of degrees, up to 90 degrees, right? Or well, 360, how well, do you do you that? Well, you are limiting yourself to three-dimensional space, you know? This is an example of infinitely dimensional space. In math, you can define, you know, vector spaces that have uh, infinite dimension. Right? And uh, orthogonality uh, means that dot product is equal to zero. In our three-dimensional space, it means that you have this. But in, uh, in a signal space, orthogonality uh, means that just that, the dot product is equal to zero. In a signal space, this waveform, this waveform, and this waveform are orthogonal. Take the dot product between them, multiply and integrate over this interval, and uh, you're going to get the result that is zero. So they are at 90 degrees, right? They are orthogonal, right? So the, 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 I mean, this vector space that we live in, is one example. It's a three-dimensional vector space. But mathematically, when you look at the Fourier uh, series vector space, it's a vector space of an infinite dimension. And all of these sines and cosines are mutually orthogonal. If you carry the analogy, you can say that the angle between cosine and sine is 90 degrees. And the angle between cosine and, and sine 2 F0 is 90 degrees. And angle between cosine and, and cosine 2 pi 2075 F0 is also 90 degrees. We have, you know, infinitely dimensional space where the dot products between these guys is equal to zero. Okay? So now, now that you realize that, then you free your mind. And this is, this is how you free your mind. Why do I actually need to limit myself to sines and cosines? You know, there can be other functions that satisfy this. If I look at these two guys, you know, they're orthogonal. So that means I can actually decompose a whole bunch of signals based on these guys, right? You know, at least, you know, get the approximation to the second order, just say x of t is equal so much of this one plus a little bit of this one, right? And there are applications where we actually do that. And uh, I have thought through and I listed some of them here or, or over there, where, where you can actually have, <laughs> where you can have decomposition where you don't necessarily involve all of this function. If you involve all of this function, you end up with Fourier series. But there are some other cases that are of equal practical use. Let me just uh, list some other examples. <coughs> so, examples of orthogonal sense. There is, a, you can use just cosine. This is use only, you don't use signs at all, because you don't really need them. Um, the cosines, you can just use uh, cosines to decompose everything. You can use signs too, but then your signal has to have a, a zero DC, because signs, they don't have this one. It doesn't belong to them, right? <coughs> but if you use cosines only, then you end up with something that's called cosine decomposition. And the cosine decomposition is what we do when we create JPEG images. JPEG images are based on cosine decomposition. Going back to your question, why you decompose? Because what you do is you take an image, determine the decomposition coefficients, these A's, right? And instead of saving every pixel, you actually save just A's. Mm -hmm. And then what, what happens as a result of that, your image shrinks tremendously. 
you know, the, the amount of information that you that you need to save, it becomes much, much smaller. And uh, you all kind of have some experience, but now you're able to understand if the image is changing slow, right? Let's say I have just an image of the white wall. How much, how good is the JPEG compression for that image? It's excellent, right? You, you take, you know, something that has, let's say, 100,000 pixels and ends up being something that has five, you know, five coefficients, right? Because basically all you're going to store is A0 and some auxiliary information in the header of the JPEG, right? Now, the, so that means, or, or, or in general, if you have an image that is slowly changing, that has a, that has a, a lot of uh, uh, areas that are of uniform color, then that image compresses really, really nice. And I'll tell you a funny story uh, after I, um, uh, I just remember. And uh, on, on the flip side, if you have an image that has a lot, a lot of detail, right, then uh, that image does not compress well. Why? Because all of these high frequency components actually end up generating a whole bunch of coefficients that you need to preserve. And they stay, right? So your image does not compress very well. So that's the JPEG compression. The, the funny story, I used to work for a, uh, for a software company and, uh, and we developed some software which really did cool things, but it was essentially just an executable with the minimum, minimum interface. And we used to charge a lot for that software and people didn't like paying a lot for something that was I think 200 kilobytes. <laughs> so one of the files that was put there was, was one of the, the image that, was, that would pop up, you know. And uh, it was a very detailed image. It, it had a lot of, uh, a, lot of uh, a lot of pixels, but it compressed well. Right, so you can actually zip up the whole software, send it to somebody, but whoever unzip it was a lot of, a lot of code. Right? Okay. All right, so, so the other decomposition that is frequently used is Hadamard decomposition. Now, if you have a signals that have sharp edges. Right, like square waves or something that, that is of this nature. Then trying to decompose this using Fourier series is not very good. And you know that. How do you know that? Because of the sharp edges, the coefficients decay relatively slow. They decay as 1 over n. <coughs> so now if I imagine, uh, uh, let's say this is my interval t. And I define the functions that look like this. These functions are mutually orthogonal. And you can see what I'm doing. This is a square wave. This is a square wave half. This is quarter, one-eighth, one-sixteenth, and so on. So, <coughs> so these are called Hadamard functions. And they can be used to uh, really uh, compress these kind of signals. Because all you do is you project this onto these functions, and get the coefficients, and save those coefficients. There are other ones. There is exponential decomposition. <coughs> you can use exponentials. You can use well, Laguerre poly polynomials. All uh, Legendre polynomials. Bessel functions. And so on. And, uh, some of these things you're going to be doing, if you, if you end up uh, working in, a, let's say, with optical fibers, then Bessel functions become natural way of, of expressing things, right? Because that's the distribution of the field in, inside, the, inside the optical fiber, and you actually like to represent things as uh, decomposed it along the Bessel functions. Hopefully, with this view here, you're going to be actually able to look at that, because a lot of times the math gets pretty elaborate. But it's just the cluckiness of the math itself. The, the idea here is really, really crisp. 
if I have, if I'm able to create a set of functions that are mutually orthogonal, then I can use this to represent a class of signals by just projecting these signals onto these functions and saving the, the coefficients of these projections. And we do that all the time because it leads to compression of the information. It leads to something that we call feature extraction, essentially looking at what, by looking at the ratio of these coefficients, you can uh, extract what is dominant in this signal. Which coefficient is the largest? Which coefficients matter? Which carry power? Which carry information? And, so on. and we do that all the time in the signal processing applications. Uh, I'm not saying that it has to be that way, but one way, for example, for face recognition, one way for, for license plates, you know, reading is kind of to do the decomposition and find out what matters and so on. All right, so let me give you some homework problems associated with this material. So here are the problems. Six, five, dash two, five, dash three, five, dash four, and five, dash five, and five, dash seven. So these are uh, problems that exercise the material we covered in this section. <coughs> okay. So, so far, we've looked at what happens when the signal is periodic. Majority of the signals that you hear about are not periodic. And so the question is, does what we learn here carry over? What we've learned by looking at periodic signals in Fourier series is that I can build every periodic signal out of sinusoidals. Right? That's the big big uh, uh, conclusion here, and we as electrical engineers see the world as built out of sinusoidals most of the time. Now the question is, what if the things are not periodic? Can I still build them out of sinusoidals? And the answer is yes, and it's going to be given by what we present today. We're going to go through Fourier uh, uh, transform and show that every signal is built out of sinusoidals. So let's uh, take a look at how we do that. So the, the title here is a periodic signal representation <coughs> by Fourier integral. Here's where we start. I have a signal x of t that's non-periodic. Looks like this. It exists in some interval t, but it does not exist forever. It starts here and it ends here. It is not periodic, therefore there's no Fourier series for it. You know, that's where my, where my whole trouble begins, because I don't know at this time what to do. But uh, for the moment, I'm assuming that it exists only in a period uh, t. For the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm going to assume that I have positioned this y-axis in such a manner that this is t over 2, and, and this is minus t over 2, or t0 over 2, right? so that it's, uh, it's symmetric. So, I, what I'm trying to do is to find out the representation of these signals based on sines and cosines, or something just sinusoids. And uh, in my desperation, because I don't know how to decompose the, this aperiodic signal, I'm going to say something like this. Well, make, let's make this signal periodic. And then I would know how to do 
And here's what we do. We uh, define a new signal that uh, looks like this. It is equal to the same signal here. Um, but then but then I actually take this and I repeat. Uh, and I repeat it on this end. So this signal here is periodic. Let's put this, uh, uh, this is of course T0. And let's call this one X T0 of T. So what is X T0 of T? X T0 of T is going to be sum over N x of t minus n t0. Okay? So it is going to be uh, some of these periodic extensions of this, uh, of this original signal t x of t. In the notes I have plus here, it really is irrelevant because n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, so it doesn't matter if it plus or minus. Now, what you see here is this uh, note. As t0 goes to infinity, right, I start separating these. Right? I take this signal, but I don't repeat it uh, uh, right here. I repeat it a little bit further. Right? So if I start repeating my signal further and further away, you can see that this becomes a periodic signal that eventually repeats at infinity. So it's t0 goes to infinity, what happens to my x of t0, x t0? Do you see that it converges to x of t? Right? So I have my signal here, I observe the part from minus t0 to t0, and I start repeating this thing. But what if I start making this zero, t0 larger and larger? Then eventually I end up with a signal here, and then it's a repetition, you know, way, way, way over in, in infinity. So as in the limiting case, when t0 goes to infinity, x t0 becomes equal to x of t. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take our signal here, decompose it into Fourier series, and then see what happens when this happens, when I set t0 go to infinity. Let's see what we get. So, so here's the story. So since x t0 of t is periodic, it has a Fourier series, and I can write that Fourier series as sum over n dn e to the j 2 pi n f0 t uh, n f0 t. This n goes here from minus infinity to plus infinity. You recognize this is our uh, exponential form of the Fourier series. And I promised you that it will have some really cool uses. This is the first one of them, right? We're gonna we're gonna use this in, in this particular example. The, this f zero is gonna be one over t zero, the fundamental frequency, which is the inverse of the of the field. Now, what do I know about <coughs> the n? The n is given as one over t zero, integral over t zero. <coughs> of x t0 of t into the minus j 2 pi n f0 t d t. Right? This is how I calculate the, the Fourier uh, coefficients for exponential waveform, uh, exponential uh, type of the Fourier series. I'm going to actually commit to the boundary, so it's, this is going to be 1 over t0 integral from minus t0 over 2 the t0 over 2 uh, x of t e to the minus j 2 pi and f0 t dt. Right. This is how I can calculate dn because if I'm just integrating from minus t0 to t0 over 2, it doesn't matter that this is periodic, right? I can say it's x of t in that in that integral. So let me put this in here and then see what happens when I let t0 go to infinity. So I have uh, 
this uh, expression here, x p0 by periodic waveform is going to be equal to sum when n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And then this integral here for dn, 1 over t0, integral from minus t0 over 2 to t0 over 2, x of t, p to the minus j, 2 pi, and n0 t, dt, and then everything multiplying e plus j, 2 pi, and m0 t. Okay. Um, so now let the t0 go to infinity. What I have on the left hand side x t0 of t is going to converge to x of t. Right? We already mentioned that as, as t0 goes to infinity if the repetition of the signal becomes after such a long time that you really have x t0 equal to x t. <coughs> On the right hand side, I look at this nf0. What does this become? As t0 becomes infinite, how about f0? Zero. Zero. F0 goes towards goes to zero. It becomes infinitesimally small. Mm -hmm. So what about nf0 then? Zero. It becomes continuous. Continuous. Yeah. Right? Look, look at this. T0, let's let's start with a finite T0. F0 is finite too. Right? So let's F0, imagine that F0 is a step. <coughs> so NF0 tells me I can pretty much get anywhere you know, making a discrete steps that are relatively large. Right? Now let me double T0. What happens then? Your steps get smaller, but since n is go, can be arbitrarily large, you can still get anywhere, you just take more steps. Now if you start increasing T0, F0 becomes smaller and smaller, but since you're multiplying this with n, that can be arbitrarily large, you actually can still get anywhere but your steps are really small. And what you're actually doing, you're sweeping the entire frequency axis, right? So your this becomes continuous variable f, right? <coughs> and the last thing, that I have this 1 over t0, this becomes dn, right? This is, these are my steps. My steps are becoming really, really small. And then this summation here, when n goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, converges to the integral when f goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. <coughs> this is not very scientific. You can actually do all sorts of <coughs> math to demonstrate that this is the case. <coughs> but here's the end result. x of t ends up being an integral when f goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, this 1 over t0 is your step now, df. This becomes an integral from t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Why? Because minus t0, as t0 becomes large, goes to minus infinity and this goes to plus infinity. x of t, e to the minus j, 2 pi, ft, dt. And then everything e to the j to pi f e. <coughs> so that's uh, uh, that's uh, where this as t zero goes to infinity, this expression here morphs into this one. And we now define x of f as integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of t e to the minus j 2 pi f t dt and we look at x of t as uh, 
integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of f <coughs> x of f uh, uh, times t to the j to pi f d. This integral here we call Fourier integral. And how do we call this one? Inverse or Fourier transform more commonly. And this is inverse Fourier transform. <coughs> okay? So that's the math. What does this really mean? Here's how you think about it. Just like we um, look, we look, we did this periodic expansion here, and we created Fourier series. Now, if I set my period going to infinity, then my fundamental frequency is infinitesimally small, right? <coughs> so Fourier transform can be seen as a Fourier series with the fundamental frequency of dn, right? In a, in a proper Fourier series, when you have a periodic signal, all you needed to build that particular signal were discrete frequencies, f0, 2f0, 3f0, and so on. Here, you need all the frequencies in a certain range, right? Because they're all separated by fundamental, fundamental frequency of d and 0. <coughs> Fundamental frequency df0. So there's another view that we can have based on what we covered earlier. What does this look like? It looks very much like a dot product, right? Dot product of what? Of x of t and this kernel here. What is the interval? Interval is from minus infinity to plus infinity. And, and what, I'm, what I'm missing here is one over energy of this part, right? But what is the energy of this? One. 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 one right? So, you see I have one. So, so, uh, so this is actually what you can, the way how you can see the Fourier transform is you're taking the signal and you're decomposing that against every single sinusoidal around the frequency axis. And then what you have is essentially saying that you can build the whole signal by summing the contribution that you're getting from every one of the, all the frequencies along the, along the axis. So that's, this is our Fourier, uh, Fourier transform. What Fourier transform showed us is that we can take a take a signal x of t that is not periodic and decompose that signal along the, along the uh, real frequency axis with, uh, with uh, using this, this uh, form. Is form one of those, are one of those supposed to be df? Uh, this one. Uh, this is this guy. This is dt. That's this part inside is here. And this is x of t. And x of t, of course, has the uh, like, yeah, you're going back and forth. <coughs> so let's uh, look a little bit into the properties of what we just demonstrated. So x of f is complex in general. If you give me an f, what x of f is going to be, it's going to be some complex number at any given frequency. 
x of f we typically can represent as magnitude of x of f and uh, e to the j phase of x of f. We give <coughs> all of these uh, terms individually uh, names. x of f we refer to as spectrum of a signal. So Fourier transform gives us spectrum of a signal. And these two components, x of f, we call magnitude spectrum. And uh, angle of x of f, we refer to as what? The phase spectrum. So we say this is a spectrum of the signal, this is the magnitude spectrum, this is the phase spectrum of the signal. Tell us how to arrange these exponentials or sinusoidals to build this particular signal. So let's take a look at an example. This is the same as the example 7.1. It says consider a signal x of t, which is given as t to the minus a t u of t, and it says determine its uh, Fourier transform. So we, we use this notation f of x of t as a Fourier transform, and what it means is integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of t e to the minus j 2 pi f t d t. That's uh, how we determine the uh, this is the formula that we just had. So, in this particular case, this is an integral from 0 to plus infinity, e to the minus a t, e to the minus j, 2 pi f t, d t. And this uh, is an integral from 0 to plus infinity, e to the minus a plus j, 2 pi f t, d t, which is just 1 over a plus j to pi. So that's a, a Fourier transform. Now, you, you notice this is a complex number for every f. So I can uh, write this as a magnitude and phase as 1 over square root of a squared plus 2 pi f squared e to the minus j arctangent of 2 pi f <coughs> over a. Okay. This is taking the magnitude and phase of this. How do I take the magnitude? Well, it's one of the magnitude of magnitude of uh, a over b is magnitude of a divided by magnitude of b. Magnitude of the upstairs is one. Magnitude of downstairs is real part square plus imaginary part square. The phase is whatever is the phase upstairs minus phase downstairs. So the phase upstairs is zero. Phase downstairs is uh, imaginary over real, which is 2 pi f over a, and because it goes upstairs, it's uh, minus a. So that's a magnitude and a phase, and usually we sketch these. So if I look at the signal in the time domain, this is how my signal x of t looks like. It's an uh, exponentially decaying signal. So this is e to the minus a t. Now, if I go into the frequency domain, then I have uh, two signals that I, two uh, functions that I need to draw. One is going to be your x of f magnitude, and this one is going to look somewhat like this. x of f, this is f. And the other one is going to be the phase that might look somewhat like this minus five angle. So this is this one here is angle of the So I have two functions. So this is what we call time domain. And this is a frequency domain. Okay, any questions on this? 
So when I plot this, what does this mean? This tells me which sinusoidals or which frequencies participate in, in, in building this particular signal. What this magnitude of x tells me is their relative magnitude, right? So it tells me, okay, these guys are way more important. And they, they contribute way more to the power of the signal than these guys over there, right? And, and, and this decays, and then the further you go in the frequency, the contribution of these components is smaller and smaller, right? Similarly to the Fourier series, a lot of cases we're gonna get that this can extend all the way to infinity, but luckily for us, the contributions of the, of the, of the frequency components that are further and further in frequency usually diminishes. And at some point we can say, well, after this frequency, the contribution is so small that I don't have to consider it, just like we did in the case of the Fourier series. Let me do another example. This is example 7.2. <coughs> I'm considering a signal rect of, uh, of x, I guess, here. Or let me say rect of t to be consistent. This rect stands for rectangular. And this is defined as 0 when uh, t is larger than 1 half, larger than 1 half, it is 1 half at t equal to 1 half. And uh, it is 1 when t is smaller, magnitude t or absolute value of t is smaller than 1 half. It seems complicated, but it is nothing uh, really fancy. It's just a square pulse that uh, is centered around the origin. And it has, uh, it looks like this. Right? It has, it, it goes from minus one half to one half. This is value here, and uh, at uh, these two points uh, where it breaks, which is defined as, as exactly, it's exactly, uh, uh, exactly uh, one half. Let me. Uh, if I, I can extend this definition, and I see that I just did that with my notes, I define the rect of t over tau, and then all that does, it actually makes this from minus tau over 2 to tau over 2, and then the width of this pulse is equal to what? Tau. Right? So that's a rectangular signal, you know, usually we draw it like this, even though, you know, so that we can see. So this is a rectangular pulse at center of the origin with the width of top. <coughs> the Fourier transform of this one of rect of t over top is um, by definition integral from minus infinity to plus infinity rect of t over top e to the minus j 2 pi f t d t. And uh, this can be easily uh, evaluated. Uh, this is equal to integral from minus tau over 2 to tau over 2, 1 e to the minus j 2 pi f tau f t, sorry, f t d t. What did I do? Well, outside of the interval from minus tau over 2 to tau over 2, this function is 0, so there's no need to integrate. All I need to integrate is in this interval, and in that interval, the value of the, of the function is equal to 1. Right? And, uh, the, the question may be, what about these two points? Well, this is an integral, so value in a single point, or for that matter, in a countable number of points doesn't matter. Right? So just, uh, Assume that this is flat you know, across across the top and uh, obtain the result. Now this one, uh, this one you got to be very careful. Uh, and I and I probably said that uh, in, in this course and in pretty much every every other course I I teach. For some, this function here is e even function, right? You can see that. It is uh, a lot of students when they face this 
and I'm going to write it, but make sure that you put a big cross over what I'm going to write now. Erroneously, they would write something like this. That this is 2 times integral from 0 to tau over to e to the minus j 2 pi f t dt. I've seen this so many times that I, that I think it's worth putting here just to alert your attention. Why is this wrong? Because it's symmetrical. If it is like uh, odd function, then it is fine. No, no, this is always wrong. Because the uh, exponential is made. Because of exponential? Because this exponential here is not even nor odd. Right? Even that even makes even. it is it is not even not odd. It has an even part and has an odd part. What's an even part? Cosine two pi f t. What's the odd part? Minus j sine two pi f t. So for some reason, we look at this, and, and a lot of a lot of uh, students say, "Oh, it's even. Therefore, I just cut this in two, and I integrate only over over positive sign." Be careful not to make that mistake. So this is wrong. The way how you you do this integral, you can say, "Okay, this has an even and odd part. Integration of the even part is twice." Uh, in the symmetrical border is twice the integration over one side. Integration of the odd part in the symmetrical boundaries is going to be equal to zero. So to simplify this, this becomes two times integral from zero to tau over two cosine two pi f t d t. <coughs> Only even part survives. Now this is a very easy integral. So uh, this is, uh, I guess, 2 times integral of the cosine is sine of 2 pi f t uh, uh, divided by 2 pi f integrated from 0 to tau over 2. And uh, when you substitute, you can see when you substitute the lower <coughs> boundary, it's, gonna, it's going to is going to be equal to zero, so this becomes uh, two times sine of uh, two pi f t tau over two divided by two pi f. Oh, sorry, just instead of this is tau over two, and it's two and two cancels. So you end up with a sine of pi f tau divided by pi f. That's, a, that's the transform. It is customary to add one tau upstairs and downstairs. So we put tau here and tau here. And then this becomes sine x from over x, which we define as a sinc function. So we define this as a, a tau times sinc of uh, pi f tau, right, sinc of whatever is here. Uh, let me alert you uh, to one important notational thing when it comes to this textbook. The textbooks are not very consistent when they define sinc. There are two definitions. There is uh, the definition one, which says that sinc of x is equal to sine of x over x. There's another definition, so this is definition one. There's a definition two that says that sinc of x is equal to sine of pi x divided by pi x, right? So both of them are found in the literature. Your book, I believe, uses different, uh, uses this as a definition of sinc as a sine x over x. Majority communications books, like, uh, uh, for example, Proactive books and, and those books that we teach in, in uh, communications form, use this definition. To make the distinction, at least for, for this course, I'm going to call this one sin pi of x, to indicate that this is now, this sin pi of x is sine pi of x over pi x. 
but be aware, you know, if we try to simplify things and then we end up complicating them because now when you see sync of x, you kind of wonder which one out of these two it, it is. So you have to go back upstairs and see which one uh, are they are they assuming. So that's how you calculate this. There is no large mystery here at all. You know, give me the function to calculate its Fourier transform. I'm going to substitute the function into this integral. You know, calculate uh, what the integral uh, yields. If I know how to do that analytically, that's beautiful. If I don't know how to do that analytically, then I just do it numerically. But calculation of the integral is, is an easy, relatively easy operation. And then what, as a result of that, I'm going to get two functions in a, in a frequency domain. I'm going to have one that represents the magnitude of the sinusoidals that are participating in the signal. This is what I'm going to call magnitude spectrum. And then I'm going to have another one that gives me the phases of those sinusoidals, which I'm going to call the phase spectrum. Now, Fourier <laughs> transform is a linear transform that has certain set of properties. I'm sure you've seen a lot of them, so let me just go quickly and, uh, and um, kind of refresh your memory of what are some of the significant properties of this transform. superposition here. And what, uh, how we express it in this scenario, if x1 of t has a Fourier transform, x1 of m, and then x2 of t has a Fourier transform, x2 of m, then alpha x1 of t plus beta x2 of t will have a Fourier transform alpha x1 of m plus beta x2 of it. In other words, if I take the Fourier, Fourier transform of the linear combination of the signals at the input, then the result is the same linear combination of the Fourier transforms of these individual signals. Um, the second one is uh, uh, conjugation symmetry. This one says if x of t has a Fourier transform x of f, and x, then x complex conjugate of t has a Fourier transform x complex conjugate of minus f. In general, you know, x of t, don't forget, can be complex signal in its own right. And it can have a real and imaginary part. So um, the, 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 this property was called. Let's demonstrate this one. So let's take a Fourier transform of x complex conjugate of t. This is integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, x complex conjugate of t uh, e to the <coughs> minus j two pi f t d t. But this can be written as integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, x of t e to the j two pi uh, f uh, t d t, everything complex conjugate. Why? Because complex conjugate is also a linear operator, so 
if I if I take complex conjugate of this, it's the complex conjugate of x of t, just like I have it here. Complex conjugate of this exponential is just flipping the sign. Right? <coughs> this thing downstairs, I can rewrite as a integral when t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity, x of t e to the minus j 2 pi minus f t dt taking complex conjugate. And then you recognize that this is essentially Fourier transform with minus f instead of f, and then everything taken complex conjugate. So this is x of minus f taken complex conjugate. Consequence, if the signal x of t is real, if x of t is real, then I have x of t equal to x complex conjugate of t, right? That's, a consequence, that's the same statement as x of t is real. It's, it's complex conjugate is the signal itself. In other words, there's no imaginary part. Then I have the following result, x of f is the same as x complex conjugate of minus f, because the left hand sides are the same, therefore the right hand sides need to be the same. Or, if I take a complex conjugate of both sides, I get that x complex conjugate of f is the same as x of minus f. Now, what does that mean? If you uh, uh, now write uh, so this is true. So if I write now x of f as a magnitude and a phase, this is a magnitude of x of f e to the j angle of uh, x of f uh, is going to be equal to the magnitude of x complex conjugate of f uh, e to the angle of x complex conjugate of f, right? And then I put here minus f and minus f. The magnitude of the complex number is is going to be actually minus f, and I just see here minus f here, and the minus f. The magnitude of the complex number is the same, right? The complex conjugate is the same as the magnitude of the complex number itself. So what this essentially ends up saying is that for real signals, <coughs> magnitude of x of n has to be even, and then the phase of x of n has to be off. Right? So that's uh, where, where this comes. If the signal is real, its magnitude is even and its, uh, its um, uh, phase is off. The third property is scaling property. And it says that the Fourier transform, uh, if, if x of t has a Fourier transform x of f, then x of uh, a t has a Fourier transform 1 over magnitude of a x of f over a. Okay. So that's, a, that's a, a scaling property. Let's then demonstrate that this one is true. So proof go somewhat like this. Fourier transform of x of a t. <coughs> By definition, this is integral from minus t goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. x of a t e to the minus j 2 pi f t d t. Just a straightforward substitution into a Fourier integral. And uh, now we have uh, two cases to consider. Uh, actually, let me, uh, the first case 
is when a is greater than zero. Okay. In that case, uh, Fourier transform of uh, x of a t becomes equal to integral when nu goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of nu e to the minus j 2 pi f uh, so nu over a d nu over a where, uh, where you can see that nu is going to be is actually a t I substituted a2 for nu but a is positive so nothing changes sum and you can see that uh, I can actually uh, see this as being uh, 1 over a taking a outside integral when nu goes from minus infinity to plus infinity x of nu e to the minus j 2 pi f over a times nu. <coughs> this is the same as the Fourier transform, except that instead of f, I have f over a. So this is now 1 over a, x of f over a, uh, the, end of the, the end of the first one. Now I'm going to look at case 2. In this case, a is smaller than 0. <coughs> if um, A is smaller than 0, then the Fourier transform of X of A T is going to be equal integral when nu goes from plus infinity to minus infinity. <coughs> X of nu e to the minus j 2 pi f nu over a d nu over a. Obviously here nu is equal to a t as well. So because a is negative, then when t is minus infinity, nu is plus infinity. When t is plus infinity, nu goes to minus infinity. Now if you if I rewrite this, this becomes uh, minus 1 over a. And I'm going to swap the, the boundaries. Nu goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. X of nu e to the minus j 2 pi f over a nu d nu. You can see that this is, again, the Fourier transform. But instead of f, I have f over a. And then this is 1 over a. But since a is negative, I can write this as uh, 1 over absolute value of a. Why? Because minus a in this case is the same as the absolute value of a. Why? Because a is negative. Okay? So that's the first part and then I have x of f over a. Okay? So I get, uh, get uh, both of these fit uh, this essentially this statement here because the absolute value of the positive number is the number itself. Okay, so let me stop here. We have a little bit, a few, few additional properties next time. So we'll continue with uh, with uh, four-year intake.